And you're ready to go, Marjorie. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm Marge Zulke, and uh, I'm a professor at UT Dallas and the director of the Center for Simulation and Synthetic Humans. Um, <clears throat> what I wanna do today is We've been fortunate to have a variety of research projects where we explore uh, various configurations of <clears throat> virtual teachers and similar kinds of synthetic entities integrating with humans. And um, I'd like to share some of our, our findings on a variety of projects. And then with the thought, of course, uh, how these uh, this, this kind of thinking could support open education. So, okay, my, my presentation is now not forwarding. Are you, let me see if I can do this one. There we go. Okay, so um, the, first pro the first research project, this is an active project that we're doing right now with um, uh, UT Southwestern Medical Center, and what we're exploring is how to um, use virtual patients to help medical school students learn how to communicate with uh, real patients better. And uh, you can see that uh, the NSF uh, specific project. So um, the, the specific name of this project is exploring social social learning in collaborative augmented reality uh, with uh, virtual agents as learning companions. So one of the things that's, as, as I mentioned in the title of my presentation there, uh, we are looking at various configurations of virtual humans to help with social learning. So I'd like to mention, we developed this project and got it funded before COVID. And it's been very interesting to me because these are the issues that were, are being explored in this research are the same ones that became very, very apparent in COVID, which is that some of the social issues, in other words, students learning informally from each other or even informally from their professors has become one of the biggest issues and one of the things that we lose when we go to a uh, strictly virtual environment. And the other thing that I would like to mention here is this project is in augmented reality using the Microsoft HoloLens 2. So what, what that means is that we are using, re augmented reality means that we integrate the synthetic, uh, synthetic environments with real environments. So in this case, we're using a virtual human as a synthetic environment, and then we're integrating that into uh, real life situations. So as you could see on my previous slide here, this is actually showing a virtual patient in an examining room with a, a student. So some of the different configurations that we're looking at here are uh, learning from a virtual peer. So the students have different scenarios that they're looking at, one with a virtual female peer, one with a virtual male peer, and then one with a virtual professor. The other scenario that we're looking at is a real professor observing a simulation distance in a distance manner. So the, the professor can give feedback, but the student is interacting with a virtual patient. And then the last configuration is two students observing each other with interviewing a virtual patient. So one student is in the same simulation as the other student with the virtual patient, and they take turns demonstrating how to do interviews and um, and uh, and then critique each other. So as I mentioned, th this is a live project going on at UT Southwestern. We've gotten really really good feedback, and we're particularly excited about this, which is called collaborative. Uh, augmented reality where the two students can get into the same simulation with each other. And next project I'd like to talk about is a, another project that's active with us from uh, that's funded by Texas, the Texas Department of Transportation, which is called VIM, which is Virtual Interactive Management. So uh, the, 
there's several really interesting paradigms that we're researching here. And again, these all have to do with an evolving virtual training and or virtual education background. And what are some of the real the real challenges and opportunities when you try to do something other than, you know, no offense to us today, but something other than a Zoom call or a, a Teams video conference or something like that. So what we're trying to do with this project is distribute virtual reality now to TechStat employees. So TechStat, as you might imagine, has thousands of employees. It's cost prohibitive and impractical to, to buy each of those employees a, a virtual reality headset. So part of this project has been looking at all the different ways that one may deliver virtual reality and explore how to get it to the employees. So we also want to have limited number of peripherals. So in other words, we really don't want to have to send head controllers and various things like this. So what we've come up with is using an iPhone. Most of the employees are given iPhones, so that, that's also a type of hardware that we can control. And then using what we call low resource virtual reality headsets and then delivering the training that way. The topic of this training, as you might guess by virtual interactive management is learning how to talk to employees in difficult situations. So how to give a review, how to coach, critique, th these types of things. The other issue here is that role play in a virtual environment. So right now, in a typical management class, if we were taking a class, the instructor would present ideas and then the students would break out in little sessions and practice on each other. It's somewhat fake, right? Because, okay, now you be the disgruntled employee and I'll be the manager like that. And the other thing in a virtual environment that adds to complexity, creating all these breakout rooms and so forth. So what, what happens, and we were just down in Austin last week um, exploring this. We have experiments going on all fall now. But um, what happens is that um, the instructor presents either face-to-face -face or virtual. And then the students can practice with the virtual humans through these uh, low resource headsets and their phones. Uh, and the other thing point I was going to make about the controllers is that this is all eye gaze navigation, which means there's no controller necessary. Uh, you do have to push a button on the low resource headset in order to um, confirm choices and things like that. But as far as navigating through through the environment, it's all uh, through eye gaze, which before this project I had never worked on and it's working surprisingly well. So uh, the other thing that we're exploring with this, as I mentioned, it, it's interesting because most employees are now choosing to do their training virtually. They do offer face-to-face -face classes and they're finding that the, the um, employees prefer virtual. So, so this becomes even more important and what we want to do is we want to be able to mail kits to the employee's house, and then they have the, the, the equipment they need to be able to do this, which we're hoping is nothing other than instructions and this headset. So as you might imagine, what's really important about this is usability, people being able to understand without somebody sitting there how to do it. So we did a, uh, uh, at our management school, we, we just chose management school students because we thought maybe they would at least conceptually understand what virtual, what management communications is about. And we worked and uh, were able to gather a set of students. We did this research at the usability lab on our campus just to see if without instructions, and we were there, but the preference was we didn't explain it. And without instructions, if the students could just have this package <clears throat> as if it had arrived in a box to their home and figure out how to use it. So this actually worked out really well. Um, and we were happy that as you can see, I, I'm, I'm just showing some qualitative data here just because it's easier to present a short talk like this, but of, of the uh, terms the students used to describe it, easy was the first one. Uh, 
fuse saying confusing. Interesting, this button that I mentioned, this navigational button that you have to have on the headsets, the, the headsets only cost $20 and you kind of get what you pay for. We're finding about 20% of 20 of them are defective right out of the box. Uh, and we still have an issue with heavy device. So in other words, if the phone in this uh, is heavy on your head, that's true on really on the HoloLens too, which cost almost four thousand dollars. So, uh, but as far as being able, what our objective was, could they understand it? Yes. Uh, again, this is uh, overall feedback. Easy to use is the number one term. Useful in training, and and keep in mind this was this was truly a usability test that we did, which means it wasn't really on knowledge because this was real text dot specific kind of information. But as far as our objective and them being able to figure it out. Quality, uh, we asked them to rate system navigation. And as I mentioned, they're using just their eyes, simple, um, no, number one term. Uh, interface element, so could they understand the interface? Clear, simple, straightforward uh, were among the terms most commonly used. So there's a system usability scale that we use in this kind of work to be able to under, to analyze. It's a standardized scale. Analyze, again, this was all about usability and human HCI, human computer interaction. And these are the questions that we ask these 10, which are made specific for our study, but they're standard questions. So a good scale on the SUS is 68, system score greater than 68. We got our mean was almost 82, 81.78. So why is this important? I find it intriguing. We all want to, we all, many people want to use virtual reality and augmented reality and these kinds of things in, in their work. And certainly we're all looking to that for the future. This is something that you could distribute a device if they have not a phone with a device that costs $20. The head, we're looking at other headsets for this project and they cost $1,500, $1,800, $400. And um, that is, I, I just sat in the talk in, for this session, this uh, seminar this morning and talking about needing, you know, we, we don't even have textbooks. And so to be able to have a device that costs even $400 is, is something that people need to think about. So that's why I'm really interested in this way of distributing virtual reality. So then another one that we're working on, um, this one is about drunk driving. And what we've done is we've created a uh, virtual human and he can emulate, uh, and I say drunk and I shouldn't say that, it's impaired driving. So it's about people who either may or may not have been drinking too much to drive, or we can also now model uh, marijuana impairment. Um, so uh, what we're doing is um, uh, the instructors, this is all for police officers in uh, the United, in throughout Texas. This was also sponsored by TxDOT. And um, it's very difficult for officers to find a way to see this. This is about nystagmus. So what this means is one's eyes twitch. <clears throat> if you've ever seen an officer on the side of the road, moving their hand back and forth in front of an unfortunate person who's been stops eyes, they want to see how quickly their eyes twitch. That's really summarized, but basically that, that the further an officer can move his finger to the corner of your eyes without your eyes twitching means the less you've had to drink. So what, or, or smoke or whatever impairment you're uh, potentially experiencing. So uh, we have a variety of ways that we simulate a, a student's eyes. And in this way, you again, you don't have to have a real drunk person or impaired person. So um, now I presume that means five minutes, right? Because I heard, uh, so anyway, um, just want to show you quickly some of the results of this. The um, we found that this works best with novice officers, so people who uh, have less than two years experience. And what you're really looking for is a gain in confidence. So um, it's very difficult to see nystagmus. It's very subtle. 
And so without having to practice on impaired people, which they do do, uh, this allows the officers to go in and see what this condition looks like. So they have more confidence to either arrest people when they need to, or not erroneously arrest people when they are not impaired. And this is a lot of data here, but what I want to summarize here is that we did an experiment a few years ago now down in Austin with the state trooper recruits. And this was, and again, one of the points in my talk here is the how to integrate these virtual humans and virtual teachers with face-to-face -face and, and real instructors or other real people that help with training and education. So we did... Insight, which is the project I just showed you, this impaired, synthetic impaired person. And they did live, they do wet, what are called wet, wet labs where they get people drunk. And then, and then we came back to see how the students did with, with the synthetic. And what's really interesting is that the largest learning gains were after the first insight session. So you can see, you know, it's like these data really quickly here, but a, a, on a, uh, uh, I believe a seven point scale, Likert scale, the mean in uh, overall confidence jumped from under three to over 5.5. And then we start with that and then we got up to 5.8. And then you can see we're at the end of that whole back and forth between the virtual and the real, how the officers advanced. But the first, the biggest jump was in the first uh, session with the synthetic human. So really quickly, um, these are some other things that we're looking at. Uh, 5G, uh, we're looking at how can we put virtual human uh, development data in the cloud and have these virtual humans be, uh, it takes a long time to make these right now. And we're really interested in dynamic generation of these characters, both from a visual and a voice perspective. I have a proposal into NSF right now trying to look at pupil contagion. In other words, um, when people are interacting, regular people interacting with each other and eye contact and uh, pupil reactions to to uh, human human interface and trying to emulate that with virtual humans. And another thing we're looking at is biometrics and uh, using some new technology, some new virtual reality technology that would help us uh, gather data on biometrics, emotion, heartbeat, things like this. And then using that, uh, doing the training synthetically and seeing how well that transfers to face-to-face -to -face scenarios. And I'll just real quickly touch on ethics. There are some. Uh, there's uh, you, accessibility issues that are very important. Uh, what is the age group that you can really use this in, in education? The, this space is changing very, very quickly and um, different devices, different research may or may not show effect on smaller, younger children and uh, who owns the data as we collect data and uh, all the, the types of things that, that we encounter uh, whenever we um, start to explore new technologies or new ways to teach and communicate. And uh, hopefully I'm right on target. And uh, that's TMOC, who is our, our mascot, and that means comet backwards. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Marjorie. That was so interesting. Thank you for sharing all that. Unfortunately, we are out of time for questions. Um, if you do have questions, you can post them in the chat, um, but we'll get ready to sort of queue up our next uh, speaker. We do have five minutes before the next presentation starts, um, but I do want to allow the next speaker to, to um to set up, but if you do have questions for Marjorie, you see her or Marge, her contact information is there. Um, and you can also post some things in the chat too. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Carrie, should I go ahead and show my screen or share my screen? Yes, uh, Marjorie, if you want to go ahead and stop sharing your screen, and I'm going to turn it over to Simon. Uh, Simon, I think I need to make you a co-host, so give me one second. Sounds good. <clears throat> OK. 
Okay, Simon, you should be able to share your screen if you want to test that out. Sounds good. So I believe you should now see my the front uh, page of my PowerPoint. Yes, I can see that. I'm, I'm going to switch back between PowerPoint and uh, another application. And so that's why I'm sharing my whole screen and not just the PowerPoint window. Um, but every now and then that leads to a couple issues. So if something is just like, if I'm, if I'm talking about, oh yeah, and you can see here and you can't see there, just let me know and I'll see what I can do. Okay. We'll do that. And, um, we have, you know, a few minutes before we start. We'll start at, at 2.25. Uh, Heidi is our timekeeper. So at about five minutes, um, or <laughs> about 15 minutes in, you'll hear kind of an audible ding. That's just a, uh, letting you know you have five minutes left um, and to allow time for, for Q&A. Okay. So, but I'll, um, I'll come back on in a few minutes and just post a, a few housekeeping things in the chat and then I'll, I'll turn it over to you, but you can leave your slides up for now. Okay, very good. Simon, would you actually prefer, would you prefer if I give you the ding like when you have five minutes left in the presentation or like five minutes and it would be a good time to end and just give half time for Q&A? What, what uh -huh. would work best for you? The presentation goes from 225 to 245. Is that right? I believe so. Okay. Yeah. yeah. If you can just ding it at 240, I think that'll be fine. I will do that. Absolutely. And if I'm, that'll be my cue. If I'm going way over, then that'll just be my cue to wrap it up and take some questions. Good afternoon. We're going to move on uh, to our next presenter. I'm going to post some information in the chat about how to access the live captions. Um, but with that, I will turn it over to Simon. Good afternoon. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I am um, I'm on my laptop. I'm in COVID quarantine right now in my bedroom at home. So I'm doing my best to present from my laptop. Because of that, I'm not going to be able to see anything in the chat um, until Q&A time. So if you have questions, uh, by all means, please ask, but I, I won't be able to see anything until we get to the end. Um, and, and I'd love to have any questions that you might want to ask. My name is Simon Ringsmith. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, power of collaboration to create multimedia OER materials. And this is really kind of a, uh, an, a case study example. Um, in this presentation, I'm going to talk about how, uh, well, by the end of this presentation, I want you to understand how to work with faculty members and support personnel to use multimedia editing tools. Uh, I want you to experience multimedia editing and production workflow, so you have a pretty good sense of like start to finish what this OER creation workflow looks like. And then hopefully by the end, we'll take some time to generate ideas for multimedia OER materials that you might want to do uh, your, uh, on, uh, by yourself. Uh, a lot of this, uh, the things that we'll cover today use um, off-the-shelf commercial software. Nothing is particularly expensive or anything like that. Um, and it, it really does uh, come out to a, 
uh, uh, it produces some good results with some tools that anyone can use. So my example for this is going to be a OER textbook or resource, really. It's more than just a textbook called Introduction to Successful Aging. And this is a uh, open textbook slash resource uh, created by Dr. Alex Bishop at Oklahoma State University. And I don't know if I said that as part of my introduction. My name is Simon Nixon. I'm from Oklahoma State University. I work in the uh, in the library and I work with the Open OK State program that is, uh, it's really the brainchild and the, it's, it's been a labor of love by Dr. Kathy S. Miller. You might've seen her in some of the other presentations. Um, all credit to the, the success of our OER program goes straight to Kathy. So I'm just um, doing the best I can to uh, uh, help her out at, in the uh, program that she has created. Um, we, uh, to create this uh, textbook, uh, Dr. Bishop received grant funding through the Open OK State program, and he wanted this textbook to fill in a gap in available resources. Um, he wanted uh, Dr. A Dr. Bishop teaches a, a course on successful aging. He's a gerontologist, and there was not a resource like this. So this OER resource was created to fill a need that, that currently was not being addressed by commercial textbooks. In this, he wanted to interview subject matter experts and um, make these interviews available as audio files. So he wanted primary sources for his students and um, have the information come directly from the researchers who are um, some of the, the researchers who helped build this field of gerontology. Um, and then also create other digital materials like graphics, student assignments, and things like that. Um, I, I can't stress enough the collaborative nature of this project. Um, there's a lot going on with uh, in with this OER resource, and it can't all be done with just one person. If I'm looking off to the side like this, that's because my notes are currently on top of an overturned hamper. Like I said, I'm at home doing the best I can with my COVID quarantine. This is Dr. Alex Bishop. He's a professor of gerontology. He's been at OSU since 2005. He's a fellow in the Gerontological Society of America. Um, he uh, studies psychology, public health, and applied math. And he is also a, considered a subject matter expert in gerontology. And then this is me. Uh, I'm a teaching and learning librarian. Um, I've been at OSU for about 13 years or so. I'm an instructional designer. Or I have been an instructional designer and video producer. I'm currently a uh, teaching and learning librarian. Um, I've also been a faculty member, and I teach uh, project management. And now it, uh, at the library, I help manage some projects. I help facilitate and coordinate some various projects. And that the, the reason I'm introducing both me and Alex is uh, to emphasize the collaborative nature of this project. So here's how this project has gone so far. Um, in the fall 2021, Dr. Bishop signed a memo of understanding detailing the scope and sequence of his successful aging textbook. And I highly recommend that uh, to anyone who is creating an OER resource that you have a signed memo of understanding saying that this is what everyone's expectations are. This is what we expect of you. And this is what you can expect of us. And it really does help put everyone on the same page so that you don't get six months, months into, the progress, into the project. And some people are saying, well, I thought I was supposed to do this. Well, I didn't know I was supposed to do this. Well, if we have this, this signed memo of understanding, then it just helps make sure everyone knows what they're doing. Um, this is actually, um, this MOU um, is based on a, a template. It's not just something we made up. It's a, it, it's a widely used template uh, developed by the University of Texas or Arlington Libraries. It's a solid MOU, um, and we, we recommend this process. In the spring 2022, I took over the project. Um, I mentioned Dr. Kathy S. Miller earlier. There is, there's way too much for just one person on this. Um, she is, she's doing about as, as much work as four or five people can take on. So I was brought on to help take over or to help with this project. And um, around that time, Dr. Bishop created what he called an author guide for the textbook. And that basically is a, it's, it's another document saying like, here's what I, here's what uh, Dr. Bishop wants in, in more specific detail for this particular OER resource, not just what are the expectations, but chapter one, chapter two, what are some broad concepts that we want to cover in the textbook? And that helps guide the creation of the textbook. I keep saying textbook. I uh, take that to mean resource because it, it's really more than just a textbook. So as far as the multimedia workflow, summer 2022, this is where things really got off the ground. Um, like let me take that back. This is where things really started to get going from a multimedia perspective. Things have been off the ground for several months at this point. Um, but 
this is when Dr. Bishop started recording Zoom interviews with the researchers who basically helped invent the field of gerontology. So you can imagine how important this resource is for his students and for ger gerontologists across the country. Um, so he would uh, he he recorded Zoom interviews with people, and then he kind of handed it off to me. Then I would transcribe, edit, and then post those interviews on Pressbooks. You might be thinking, well, transcribe. Um, on the right-hand side, you see a transcription right here. Why would I need to go in and transcribe these interviews? Well, these Zoom transcriptions are not accurate. Anyone who's worked with these knows that they're just, they're about anywhere from 80 to 90% accurate. But these uh, people that Dr. Bishop was interviewing, a lot of them, um, their, their microphones aren't that great. Uh, there's a lot of static. There's a lot of thick accents. Like the, the transcript on Zoom is just not reliable for what we need here. Um, and then I also send a, a, a transcript of the interview when I'm done. I, I send kind of a more human readable as opposed to a, a, a caption format of this whole interview for, or all these interviews for uh, Dr. Bishop to review. Um, so that's kind of the whole process. Uh, Bishop records the Zoom interview. I transcribe, edit, and post on Pressbooks. I'm gonna show you how I actually do that. Um, this whole process though, is rooted in collaboration. You have to have collaboration for all this to work. Uh, Dr. Bishop and I meet on Zoom <laughs> about every three weeks. It, it kind of varies, but we have a, a meeting where we just talk about what's going on. Um, and I highly recommend that to anyone who's doing this sort of process that you you have regular meetings um, with the person that you're working with. Uh, for a while, we just got to know each other, talk about our kids, talk about families, where we're from. And then we would build on that foundation. We'd discuss long-term and short-term goals for the project, create a roadmap, and then we'd check on our goal progress as we go along. So that's sort of a high level view of this. Now let's get into the nitty gritty of actual production. I think this is kind of the most fascinating part. I know I'm talking 90 miles an hour and there is some things coming in chat. I will get to that. Um, I can't even see the chat. I can just see it. Two things have been said. So keep those questions coming. I'll get to as much of those as I can. Um, as far as the production workflow then, um, I when, when Dr. Bishop hands these interviews off to me, that's when I trim off the beginning and the end. I remove a lot of filler, and I'll show you what I mean by filler. Um, for examples, things like ums, ahs, you knows, just empty space. Uh, the people that Dr. Bishop talks with, they, they, um, they would often take a while thinking about what they're going to say and then say it. So there's a lot of dead space. Um, and then I would also type captions. As I mentioned, the Zoom captions are not that accurate. And uh, typing new captions... Um, is a lot better than editing existing captions. If you are involved in transcribing, um, you probably have seen this before as well. Um, after this, I'm going to switch over to Camtasia here to my editing environment. So this is Camtasia, and this is the software that I use. It's just off-the-shelf software. And I'm going to show you examples of a couple things that I do. First, I trim unrelated content at the end, and I'm going to hit play and see if you can hear this. I'm going to stop the recording So for this uh, short interview. Um, well, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. So, okay. Um, so, did you all hear that at the end? Um, there was a little bit that uh, where he said, "Okay, I'm going to go ahead and stop this recording." I don't need that. I can trim that off, and so I can just uh, hit the the delete button and, and get rid of that. Um, also, there's a lot of ums and ahs. So I'm going to go to 26 minutes and 10 seconds here, and uh, see if I can trim out some ums and ahs. And you'll see what I mean here. Things, um, optimal. So I guess those three things, um, optimal, optimize, um, uh, uh, what, I, what, I, what I was just talking about in, in terms of. Uh... So there's three ums and there's some time when he's trying to just sort of find his answer. I, I don't really need that. That's not relevant to the interview. So I could just trim that out as well. And I don't do any sort of editorializing. At no point am I removing actual content from this interview. I'm removing filler that is not really necessary for the 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 interview, for the substance of the interview. Um, if I go to 24 seconds and uh, 24, 24 minutes, 48 seconds, um, there's some blank space here. To adjust and adapt to changing conditions becomes, I think, uh, very important. Um, and I guess... So there's this blank space. I can just trim that out as well. And I'm going to switch back to my PowerPoint. 
Uh, you might be thinking, well, come on, like, does this really matter? It actually does. Um, I, I, after all this editing, um, each recording is about 10% shorter. And on a, that, that really does add up all that time. Um, if it's a, a 20 minute or a 25 minute recording that saves like two to three minutes. And if you're listening to 10 of these throughout the course of the semester, like this time does add up and it really does make everything a lot more streamlined. And it's not like hyperspeed, like going up to YouTube and clicking play at 1.5 times. It's just removing extra stuff that's not really necessary for all of this to happen. I also go into Camtasia and I add, uh, this is where I do transcript. I do captions and click captions. And here I can- Bumpy road and it becomes a challenging road and your ability to adjust and I use the captioning, uh, the captioning tool here to then type out what I hear in the interview, which is obviously not what I'm <laughs> just typing my own words here, but I, I caption the whole video. And that way, if at any point Dr. Bishop wants to make videos available to students, these videos then also have captions, not just a transcript, but a caption that follows along with the interview. Um, I'm gonna go back to my PowerPoint. Um, just to make sure I'm, I'm making this um, uh, like I'm getting everything right here. Manual versus automatic captions. If they're automatic, they misspell names. It's unreliable punctuation grammar. Uh, you can't download them. Um, editing automatic captions is a lot more tedious. In order to maximize accessibility and readability and just make sure the, the impact of these is as great as it can be, manual captions are the way to go. Um, it does take time, but it's near 100% accuracy. Then I go to Pressbooks. Uh, you've probably heard about Pressbooks uh, either at your own institution or you've heard about today. It's a, it's an amazing platform. Um, after all this, I go to Pressbooks. I create a new chapter. I copy and paste the edited captions. And down here, you can see this is uh, from the chapter with Merle Silverstein. I'm here today talking with Merle Silverstein from Syracuse University. Dr. Silverstein is <laughs> a longstanding, I guess you describe yourself as a family gerontologist. I wrote that during the transcribing process. And then students can read the entire interview just like they would read it in a uh, like a, a magazine or a, a newspaper or a publication, or they can listen to the audio, or they can do both. Uh, click the play while they follow along, and that really does have a lot of advantages for students um, to be able to follow along like that. Um, in terms of um, the um, software, all I use is Camtasia and something called Downy. I'm on a Mac and Downy is a uh, application that lets you download any video from any source on the internet. That's how I get the videos from Zoom. Zoom doesn't always make it easy to download their videos. You can play them, but you can't always download them. So Downy is like a $20 app and uh, it's it's uh, worth 10 times that price. And Camtasia, you've probably heard of that. Uh, if not, it's just fantastic editing software. Um, that is, honest to goodness, the substance of my presentation. If we have time, I'd like to talk about what subjects you teach, how this process could work for you. Um, and any questions that you have, I'm actually going to uh, stop the screen share now. I mean, that was really fast. Um, and go to the uh, Q&A uh, in the chat, uh, because I'm supposed to stay about five minutes for the, the any sort of q and I know there's a lot coming at you really fast, but um, in 15 minutes, my goal was to help you understand the entire workflow of creating this multimedia OER resource and the collaborative nature of it, working with Dr. Bishop really closely. And in the end, we have this resource we're creating. I think he's done nine interviews. He texted me yesterday. He emailed me yesterday. He's got a 10th interview done. So I'll be starting on that. Um, and it's just been a really fun, fascinating project to work on. Um, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn it over to the chat and uh, see if you have any questions, comments, uh, anything there. And uh, someone said, uh, in my case, 20% accurate. Yeah, that's, you know, I, I really do appreciate the automatic tran the automatic transcriptions. Um, they've really been uh, a, a huge um, gift to all of us, especially with uh, Zoom and, and uh, all that. But yeah, they're, they're just not accurate, especially not for this type of resource. We need it to be basically 100% accurate um, if students are going to use this um, in, for actual um, textbook material. So uh, questions from the audience. Will I pause to take a sip of water? Yes, if anyone does have questions, you can post them in the chat or you should be able to unmute yourself and ask uh, via the microphone. We have about four minutes for questions. 
I'll type my email in the chat. If anyone has any questions beyond this, please email me. I'd be happy to talk. Cynthia, do you use the video files for anything? Um, not yet, no. We are. We may use them at some point. And if we do, then we have them available. But uh, right now, it's just the audio files. And that's kind of going to be up to Dr. Bishop about what he wants to do with the videos. But if we do need the videos, we have them ready to go with full captions. Um, they're, they're SRT files. And uh, we just have to click one button, export, and we're ready to go. Um, only provide the audio file. Yeah, we. that's really the goal. There's also a bandwidth issue. Um, the audio file is anywhere from like 5 to 15 megabytes. And if someone's accessing this on cell data, or if they're away, if they're if bandwidth is an issue, they can download the audio recording or play it from Pressbooks. And uh, the the data component really isn't that much of a of a, a problem for them. So it it's also goes to the accessibility uh, feature. Um, Sabrina, I can't wait to share the recording with a faculty member. Oh, great, thank you. And Sabrina, feel free to contact me if you have any questions. I'd love to talk more about this stuff. Um, I'm an electrical trades. Any multimedia you recommend over other? Mm, I, I don't know that I'd recommend anything. If you're talking software, uh, Camtasia is uh, the best for this that I can see. I, I've used Final Cut Pro for years. I've used Premiere. Um, I've been doing a lot of stuff in multimedia, but Camtasia for just creating simple for this workflow, Camtasia is awesome. And then you can share the, the Camtasia project file with other people if you need to. Um, the the captioning in, in Camtasia could be a little better. It, it's a little cumbersome, but it's not bad at all. So I don't know if that answers your question, um, Salvador, but that's, uh, if not, just email me and I'd be glad to talk more. Any other questions? This is great. I, I really appreciate it. So is there is there any way of uh, actually editing the, the transcription? Oh yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, you could do that right in Camtasia. Um, you or afterwards too. Like you, what I do is I take, I actually go to Camtasia, generate all the captions, export the captions as an SRT file, and then I pull up those captions on one side of my monitor in in a text file, like it's a text document, and then I have Camtasia playing the the interview on the left hand side of my monitor, so that uh, I read along as the video is playing, just as of another check on this on the, the whole process to make sure I've typed everything correctly and got names spelled correctly and, and terms uh, spelled correctly. So yeah, it, it really, um, uh, I, I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah, you can easily edit these captions. And then I import that same SRT that I've edited back into Camtasia and overwrites the old one and it replaces any errors with my fixed version. It's super easy. And in order to open the, you have to open the audio file from Camtasia? Um, so the, in Camtasia, you can export the video as an audio file, which is what I do. Um, okay. or you can export the Camtasia file as a video and then open that video and export the audio from the video. Like there's, it's, it's really flexible. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Well, thank you to everyone. This is always fun to do. I feel like I could talk for an hour on this, um, but uh, I hope it wasn't too much coming at you in just 15 minutes here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Simon. You bet. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you. Thank you, Sabrina. Thank you, Ivina. We have about a five minute break before our next presentation. So I'm going to pause the recording for now and we'll uh, queue up for the next presenter. Uh, so if you're staying in this room, uh, you have about a five minute break uh, and we'll, we'll see you in, in a few minutes. Okay, go ahead, Midori. Okay, hi. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Midori Kitagawa. I'm a research professor at the University of Texas at Dallas in the Department of Science and Math Education. Um, my today's talk is titled um, Introduction to an Innovative Open Educational Resource Scaffolded Training Environment for Physics Programming. Um, step is a project fund, uh, funded by uh, NSF's 
STEM and plus STEM plus computing program, and then the uh, project is very cross disciplinary. And then I had you no, know, I have had you no know, this project with my colleagues, uh, Professor Mary Ackford, Professor Paul Fishwick, Professor Michael Kesten at the UTD, and Professor Rosanna Guadagno at the University of Oulu in Finland. Um, I said the you know, project is very cross-disciplinary and it's a collaborative, collaborative effort by uh, researchers in multiple disciplines. I mean, science and mass education, but I was formerly in art and technology. Um, Rosanna is in psychology, and Mary is the chair of the science, science and mass education, and she's in physics as well. And Michael is in physics, and Paul is in the School of Art, Humanities, and Technology. Also, he's in computer science. And we had a number of high school teachers as our subject matter expert and a number of graduate and undergraduate students from computer science, A-Tech and psychology and as in the schools and the department of UTD as a um, research assistant. Well, what is STEP? So STEP is an environment for high school and college students to build physics simulations to learn physics concept, modeling, and computational thinking in a synergistic manner. We have built three step learning modules on 1D kinematics, 2D kinematics, and Newton's law of motion using Unity game engine. And you can see uh, the main menu of our step program showing off module one, module two, and module three. We have tested those you know, three modules at local high school and UTD. And we used the um, post concept inventory and computing attitude survey and you know, CT measure we developed to the not test no students learning. Um, major characteristics of no steps are the following. Step is free and accessible. You know, step is an open educational resource intended for introductory physics. And in step, students can create their own simulations of mechanics problems using a modeling tool that is based on the finite state machine, which, which you know, I will talk more about soon. And step is scaffolded and multiple representational. So in this in a presentation, I'd like to talk about you know, computational thinking, finite state machines, scaffolding, multiple representation, Unity platform and accessibility and adaptability. Let me start with computational thinking. City. Janet Wing's you know, 2006 article about the you know, city inspired educators to define and operationalize city in various fields. General agreement among you know, educators and uh, scholars seem that students need CT to be successful in various STEM fields and also in everyday life. And CT needs to be contextualized in each STEM discipline, meaning that you know, there is no definition of CT which is you know, universally valid in every field. Our research team, the step project team, identified problem decomposition, abstraction, algorithms, and modeling as the CT concepts that are most important in learning physics concepts. 
and problem solvings in physics. Okay, and then let me move on to finite state machine. F FSMs or state diagrams are method of state-based modeling. FMS have been used in software engineering and hardware development for decades and in video game design in recent years. Uh, here is a definition of no finite state machine. An FSM is designed to achieve a task or a series of tasks, and it consists of a discrete set of states and a set of conditions that trigger transition between these states. The machine can only be in one of these states at any given time. Yeah, I'd like to know, note that you know, states, the word state is not defined in different way in different you know, discipline. And you know, the state of the you know, final state machine should not be confused with you know, physical state in physics. Um, in step, FSM can be built using up to 12 states. But you know, here I have um, FSM built in step using you know, three states. The in state you know, transitions are represented by green triangles, and the current state is indicated by yellow outline. We decided to use as you no know, FSM as you no know, modeling tool because FSMs are effective in teaching CT because they help students learn integral elements of CT that include the four elements we identified as most important in learning physics and also you know, some other you know, CT elements such as you know, iterative thinking, conditional logic efficiency and debugging. To model physical situations in step, students construct, execute, and manipulate FSMs within the step environment. There is no need to code in a programming or scripting language, and the step has no low entry threshold in terms of the prerequisite skills. Moreover, FSMs in step can be saved in two files and shared with others, enabling the five R, five R activities, meaning that the um, step users can retain, reuse, revise, remix, and re re redistribute step activities. Steps graphical user interface is designed to minimize the amount of typing students need to do and eliminate typographical syntax and formatting errors, which novice programmers often experience and suffer from. Now, hence, no step users do not face the steep learning curve common in programming. Okay, let me move on to scaffolding. Scaffolding is an instructional method with two key aspects. The first one is to provide structure and support for completing the task. And the second is to gradually remove support so that the students can independently solve the problem. And we create a you know, software enabled scaffolding in step. So, as software enabled scaffolding introduce physical concept at increasingly higher levels of each module, students learn how the intuitive states of motion can be rigorously defined in the language of physics. You can see a screen capture of a uh, lower part of uh, step module one's interface, which shows you know, 
uh, the five levels in module one has. And you can see that the level one is natural language. And uh, as you know, levels go up, you know, uh, they are introduced to displacement, velocity, and acceleration. Okay, now let me talk about multiple representations. In each level of each step module, okay, in, <laughs> each level of each step module is designed for students to model a mechanics problem as an FMS and see the simulation result as animation, graphs, numbers, equations, and as a representation, all of which are synchronously displayed. And you know, graphical representations are color coded. Let me show you this. So this is a example of simulation student can do in model, module two and level three in our step. And as you can see, as the animation of the simulation is played, graphs are drawn and numerical data are updated. And motion uh, defined by state one is uh, displayed in blue, and motion defined by state two is orange uh, in final state machine here. Uh, in trail of the object's motion and graphs, and also no timeline for playback. To avoid you know, creating a you know, heavy cognitive load, the display of each type of representation can be turned on and off independently. For example, no, here you can see trail, which you know, shows the path of uh, objects motion is displayed. Uh, here you can see acceleration is displayed. And here you can see the you know, grid is displayed, but none, none of them is displayed in here. Uh, these are screen capture of the same simulation I just showed you. And here, almost all the display options are turned on. It's very busy and confusing. And then here, you can see only graphs, background image, axis, and you know, trail are displayed. And here, uh, all display, all the representation are turned off except for trail. Okay, now let me talk about Unity platform. We wanted the minimal cost and ease of use to promote the adoption of step in physics classes across the United States. We looked for portable, affordable, readily available technology and decided to build a step on Unity cross-platform game engine and its development software. Because uh, using Unity, numerous commercial video games, already a large number of games have been published and also not research and educational tools have been developed and published internationally. And Unity is free for academic use and widely used in K-16 education and education research. And according to um, Unity technology, over 10,000 schools worldwide use Unity in the classroom. Finally, accessibility and adaptability. Okay. Students access step using a web browser on a desktop computer or a laptop computer without installing Unity, without the you know, need to install Unity or any other application. That means you no know, step requires you no know, special equipment or software. 
the step has no low entry threshold in terms of cost and prerequisite skills. The first three step modules are aligned with next generation science standards and techs. I mean, Texas no standard. And the topics covered in those modules are taught in high school physics classes, as well as an introductory college physics classes across the United States. Teachers can let you know, their students simulate their own world problems in their own curricula using STEP and step zero modularity and versatility allow step to be included in existing curricula with ease. The three step modules are available to the public at step.utdaras.edu at no cost to users. And step can be easily and affordably deployed in schools, including ones with the higher rates of economically disadvantaged students. This offers students an opportunity to learn physics, modeling, and computational thinking that might not otherwise be available. Step modules and tutorials are available at step.utdaras.edu. Now, please you know, try step and let us know what you think. And also, you know, please you know, let you know, teachers and the students know about step. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we do have a few minutes uh, for questions. If anyone would like to post a question in the chat, or if you want to unmute yourself, uh, you're welcome to ask the speaker. Um, a few questions about her presentation. So thank you so much. That was really interesting. And I posted the link to um, the STEP program in the chat as well. Thank you. Oh, any questions? I'm not seeing any questions come in. Um, if there are none, I'll go ahead and pause the recording and our next session uh, in this block will start at 3.15. So you can all give yourselves a little bit of a break. Thank you again, uh, Midori, for sharing uh, sharing the STEP program and uh, the scaffolded approach to this. So it's, it's really interesting. I'm gonna take a look at it for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Okay, we're ready to go. Okay. Um, hello, I'm Melinda Seaton. I am at Texas A&M in Commerce. And Liz, are you here? Yes, I am here as well. Hi. And hello, I'm Liz Kim. I'm based out of uh, Texas A&M in Kingsville. <clears throat> okay. Sh we'll just jump in and explain what we're doing. Um, I'm gonna, Liz. I'm gonna let you start. Okay, sure. So this project uh, is uh, an OER project uh, that was funded by uh, the coordinating board of the uh, GEAR OER grant program. Uh, and uh, at the start of the project, um, basically, uh, we're gonna just explain a little bit about um, in this presentation, uh, how the project came together uh, and how we started our uh, collaboration across campuses between uh, Texas A&M Kingsville and Texas A&M Commerce, uh, as well as uh, sharing some of the uh, challenges as well as uh, the rewards of collaborating across uh, institutions in order to uh, um, complete this project. Uh, and we are, uh, our field of uh, instruction is art history. <clears throat> 
And art history, as I talk to my students about, as I explain to my students, uh, is essentially the course that uh, we have uh, worked on together uh, for this OER implementation between Kingsdale and Commerce uh, is a set of two courses, a series of two courses that is essentially a world history course, but uh, looking at uh, uh, the history of the world through uh, objects, uh, object-based uh, perspectives of how humanity uh, created civilizations. Uh, and, excuse me, uh, in our field, uh, we, uh, we have multiple choices when it comes to textbooks, uh, but uh, when it comes to uh, our project, what we decided to do is to uh, use a utilize a uh, already existing OER uh, called Smart History, uh, and it is a peer-reviewed art history textbook uh, that uh, that is widely used within the discipline already. <laughs> Excuse me. And that's a view of smart history there, our textbook. And uh, each of these thumbnails are essentially uh, um, articles that students could access uh, to learn about a particular uh, time period and uh, uh, particular important works within um, art historical canon. So uh, it's already existing. So what we had to do with this uh, grad project was to implement it, excuse me. And in my case, um, my chair, my department chair had already uh, approached me about um, converting to, uh, to an OER based course uh, because before um, the OER conversion, the, the project, uh, our campus <laughs> had been <laughs> using a, uh, a paid for textbook um, that is standard within the discipline uh, that has been used for decades called Gardener's Art Through the Ages. And this textbook is, um, it costs about $80 uh, per semester for our students. Um, and my department chair had already approached me about uh, converting to an OER based course. Uh, and so I started looking for um, uh, possible, <laughs> excuse me, grant opportunities that could help me with that uh, project. And very fortunately, the, the timing of the uh, OER Cure grant uh, uh, coincided with um, the initial uh, project plans that uh, my department and I uh, had put together. And so, um, the uh, grant uh, specified that uh, it's more favorable to have uh, partnerships um, in terms of um, actually getting the grant. It's uh, better to have partnerships across <laughs> different campuses, uh, different universities. And so what I <laughs> uh, started doing is essentially cold calling uh, by email, uh, different art historians <laughs> within the uh, Texas A&M system and uh, Melinda, my, uh, my project partner, uh, I was able to connect with her in that way. Um, and do you wanna say a little bit about, uh, uh, Melinda, do you wanna say a little bit about uh, your perspective when it comes to taking on this project uh, in terms yeah. of uh, the challenges? Sure, um, I was really excited um, actually when Liz contacted me because I had just started working on trying to revamp our art appreciation class, which is a more another core class um, to have um, be OER because the textbooks are so expensive and we're trying to consolidate. So we're all teaching um, similar content. And so um, this was a good impetus in getting some of the information and help from um, Liz to put it together was really great. Um, it also, for me on our campus is, um, our department hasn't been the best at collaborating with other people on campus as well as on other like sister campuses like Kingsville. And so a big challenge for me was finding um, people on campus that was willing to assist us with the project. And I, it ended up being a great experience because the, I worked closely with um, our library staff, um, a team with our academic technology, 
and then also with sponsored programs. So it was for me being a relatively new faculty member here in commerce, this was a project that not only helped me to meet people like Liz from other campuses that are doing art history and teaching the similar classes, but also to um, see how other partnerships on campus would work to help make these types of projects possible for students. Yes, and uh, in my case, uh, in terms of partnerships, um, it uh, was both external as well as internal. So when it comes to external, um, the partnership was through the a and uh, Commerce Campus. Um, in uh, terms of internal partnerships, uh, I had reached out to, I was working with, uh, I had been working with um, our uh, grants office, our sponsored program office, as well as uh, our uh, technology office and the instructional designers there um, and uh, reaching out to them to see if they are interested. Uh, and they were very excited for an opportunity to uh, work on an OER based project uh, because it's part of uh, the technologies office uh, and uh, <clears throat> their goals uh, in terms of you know, making technology more uh, user friendly for our students um, and also you know saving them a uh, substantial amount of money uh, by using a free textbook and converting a, a couple of courses a series of courses um, to um, be taught off of uh, OERs uh, and so um, reaching out across um, especially to our technology office and uh, working with the instruction uh, it, instructional designers there uh, that had been very re rewarding uh, for me in terms of this project. Um, and uh, just kind of continuing on uh, from uh, that point about um, initially reaching out to them and uh, getting their, um, uh, their commitment in terms of uh, uh, their time, uh, in terms of um, their contributions to this project, the instructional designers uh, in our technology office. Um, the next important step was the actual implementation after we had been successful in obtaining the grant <laughs> and um, the in-kind contributions that the grants office, not, not the grants office, but the technology office was able to provide us. Uh, it consists, <laughs> excuse me, consisted mostly of um, basically quality control for our uh, our courses and um, over the course of uh, <coughs> a couple semesters, um, uh, the grants office and I uh, have been working on uh, getting the online course that <laughs> I had designed uh, based on the OER to uh, meet uh, quality assurance guidelines. Uh, that was based on that has been based on uh, QM standards, quality matter standards, um, and we have been working to get the course. Um, it's uh, um, it's quality up to the standard uh, that is required for uh, QM certification, essentially, and a lot of that um, had to do with um, <clears throat> needing. Uh, like accessibility requirements when it comes to the online course, um, when it comes to the OER, integration of the OER into the teaching uh, part of um, uh, teaching of art history um, for these two courses and also for uh, working on uh, objectives um, module as well as uh, course objectives uh, that um, that is more uh, QM friendly uh, because uh, QM quality matters uh, assurance. Um, it's essentially uh, one of the key uh, concepts of quality matters. Um, um, its standards is just getting the alignments right uh, between the objectives for the course as well as the different parts of the course. So that each of the modules. Uh, the objectives have to align with all the assignments as well as the readings. And so I've been working on um, throughout the project uh, with our instructional designers to make sure that uh, it's um, the core standards um, 
meet uh, the rigorous guidelines that uh, that is uh, uh, provided by Quality Matters on my end. Melinda, do you want to share your perspective? Um, I worked also um, in terms of implementing it. I got a tremendous amount of help from our library staff. Um, we've had some shifts, though. Some of the challenge that I have met um, here in commerce is changing staff in the sponsored programs um, department, which caused some problems with communication between OER Texas, um, the grantees, and um, our office and what was being done, which was a little bit of a challenge. It was also interesting for me because I haven't done any grant writing or been awarded any grants in Texas before, and the system is quite a bit different than at the university where I worked prior to being here. And so I was able to really learn about new ways of working with different funding partners. And then also um, in terms of the cost share, the librarians and our technology, um, academic technology person were extremely helpful in helping me develop, um, like Liz said, making sure everything works correctly. And also one of the big things that um, I had not thought about was the, um, content approval of making sure it was open access and that all the materials we had, we had noted the copyright and the um, different rights that are associated with the images correctly. And so that really benefited us is to have that information that I could then share with Liz and we could add to the course that we put together on um, OER Texas. Yeah, so we, <clears throat> Between the two of us, also, uh, although we were, you know, partners in this project, we had uh, each a different um, internal partnerships and different uh, goals when it comes to our, uh, each of our courses. Uh, so on my end, uh, I've been working on um, more <coughs> quality insurance uh, assurance for uh, the course, whereas uh, Melinda's uh, in Melinda's case, uh, she has been working more on the uh, technological side of uh, things and uh, being able to share the course in a more kind of uh, different um, through various platforms. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. <laughs> um, but in terms of um, the um, project uh, and its um, uh, the implementation, uh, the end process, uh, the product of our a grant project uh, was to uh, basically uh, impl implement the course through different platforms. And um, <clears throat> just as um, between uh, Kingsville and Commerce, uh, we had different goals when it come each other, different goals when it come, came to our specific campuses and departments. Uh, we also have been using different um, LMSs. Um, and so our campus uh, at Kingsville, we use Blackboard. And so when it comes to the implementation of, of the project, uh, <coughs> excuse me, in designing the course, um, this was uh, done mostly on Blackboard on uh, my end. And Melissa, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> Melinda, could you uh, uh, go forward? I want, uh, couple slides. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, so <laughs> this is uh, the perspective of um, uh, the course that I designed on Blackboard. And so when I have, um, when I implemented it, for those of you who are using Blackboard, um, you will be <laughs> familiar with this <coughs> screen, excuse me. But Essentially, um, what I used in order to implement this uh, OER uh, onto <laughs> this Blackboard course is a uh, modules uh, is the modules structure, um, and with the module structure, uh, I could uh, create different learning modules, uh, and essentially each of the chapters that I've designed um, based on this OER. Uh, it became one module. And so as you could see on this screen, um, I have a list of uh, the different articles uh, that, pertaining, that pertain to a specific um, topic. In this case, uh, it's the art of the Stone Age. <laughs> and um, 
after compiling my job when when it came to uh, implementing this course is essentially a compiling a different series of articles uh, that could be used uh, in order to um, basically replace uh, the, the expensive textbooks that we have for art, art history. And so uh, the <laughs> compilation of the articles, uh, we see he's listed under this module. And at the end of the module, we uh, <coughs> I also designed a quiz uh, based on the, the articles uh, that, um, that are assigned for each of the modules. So that's what it looks like on the Blackboard side. Um, and um, we also um, uh, put this together for uh, the, um, the, the OERTX uh, website as well. Um, and uh, OERTX, of course, is the coordinating board's uh, website that uh, basically brings together all the OER resources across the state um, available to anyone. Um, <coughs> and uh, in our case, with uh, our two courses, Arts <coughs> 1303 and 1304, um, we also implemented these um, by comp um, compiling into the list of uh, the articles uh, onto uh, the OERTX website um, according to each of the uh, different uh, learning modules as I described on uh, Blackboard. We also implemented these uh, onto uh, OERTX as well uh, based on its uh, own um, platform-based uh, structure. So Melinda, do you wanna? Sure, so um, while Liz decided she created this where we have direct links. So a course could just be linked to from any LMS system. I was working with the new technology we started using on campus, working closely with the library, which is the Legato reading list tool. And the library, it was wonderful because the library went in and checked all of the links to make sure everything works. And I followed the same module system that Liz did um, for her class. And so I'm actually introducing this to students for the first time for face-to-face -face classes. But one of the benefits to this is if you can see, they can access the reading list. And then when it's broken up, it's all of the links here, but it also allows for student discussion. Um, that happens within the modules. And so there can be some interaction between the students as well. And then I, on our campus, we use D2L. And so I just created um, a link that goes to this reading list, whoops, to this reading list platform. And the students can access it there. And it's organized in the same way in which the modules are um, that Liz created for the OER Texas um, platform as well as can just be linked directly. Not a lot of campuses use the Leganto reading list, but it is available. The links that we created for different pages on um, the OER Texas website um, will take you to this and you can actually view it even if you don't have an account, but you can't link to it or create that system. Um, but we did create a possibility where if people do have this technology on their campus, they can use it as well. And so it's just an alternative way to access the same materials. Um, the one thing that is slightly different for the Leganto reading list is that for the um, basic one um, here is we have direct links for each module and it's been condensed for, could just be used exactly as is, as a course. For the Leganto reading list, we incorporated a few more sources so that instructors could have some options. And all of these also were exported as PDFs so people could create their own links as well. Um, and then I'll go back to Liz with our, since we're running out of time to our- Yeah, I was just gonna say, we, we, we are at time. So if uh, I do wanna give enough time for the next uh, presenter to set up. So if we have a, another minute or so, um, but I do, I do wanna give space for, um, sure. for questions too, so. Yeah, um, just want to kind of you know mention that um, you know, in terms of uh, student satisfaction, um, they were um, all of my students um, have been very satisfied uh, with our conversion to a free textbook. Uh, they're always excited about uh, saving money, um, and um, on on average uh, on our campus, I teach uh, about 200, um, 200 students per semester. 
um, uh, for these two series of courses. Uh, and so essentially I'm sa saving students um, on each semester about um, on average about $17,000 by teaching off of uh, this um, OER instead of um, having them pay for a textbook. Um, and so that's per year uh, savings of that's, you know, I pass on to the students of approximately about like uh, $35,000 now, which is quite uh, substantial. Um, and so it's been very successful um, on our end um, on that front. And Melinda. Yeah, I share the same kind of benefits that Liz has of the cost saving, but I have seen an increase in the students actually doing the reading and their academic performance has increased since we switched to the OER from the traditional textbook. So that has, that's been our presentation and our experience of the challenges and rewards of uh, you, uh, converting in, uh, to an OER based uh, uh, course, core courses. So um, if anybody have any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. Thank you both so much. And I know um, one of my colleagues is posting links to your courses in the chat uh, from the OER Techs website. So thank you, Kyla, for doing that. Um, I do, if you do have questions, if you could post them in the chat and I'll have the speakers address your questions via chat. Um, I just wanna be able to give time for the next speakers to set up. But thank you so much, uh, Liz and Melinda, for your presentation. I really enjoyed uh, seeing the work from, from the grant and seeing how you put it together. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. OK, uh, Amber, you're ready to go. Just let me know when you need me to advance the next slide. Will do. Thank you very much, Carrie, for your wonderful assistance. And everyone, really, who's been on the conference, it's been a very engaging two days so far. Uh, my name is Amber Rayleigh, she, her pronouns, and I'm calling in from the University of Texas at Arlington. Uh, we're going to today uh, be talking about OER to transport, our project. And so we have this clever get on the bus, uh, and, and hopefully you will, in seeing uh, the connections here to diversity, equity, and inclusion through OER in transportation planning. Go ahead. So this project uh, would not be possible uh, without the contributions of a lot of ind individuals. Um, so they'll be on the next slide. Uh, you'll see, uh, first of all, our, our grantee, uh, the U.S. Department of Education's FIPSI, that's Fund for the Improvement of Post-Secondary Education Open Textbooks Pilot Grant, and our partner institutions, the University of South Florida and Cal Poly. Um, so these are uh, a lot of dedicated individuals at these institutions, not only the instructors who are writing the textbooks, uh, a lot of graduate assistants, and librarians who have all come together to make our project possible. And I certainly encourage you to take a look at the link that I posted uh, before to see uh, the, the variety of individuals involved in this project. Go ahead. So first, why uh, OER in transportation planning? So I, I was in some of the earlier sessions and a lot of folks talked about the unique characteristics of particular fields that might have led them to pursue OER. And we'll talk about some other ones, but a key driving force is actually demand from the industry in transportation planning to have a more diverse workforce. And, and this is important, uh, not only just for the sake of diversity, equity, inclusion, but really for how our cities are planned uh, and really taking into perspective the demographics and experiences of communities in the planning process. And we see that the three states represented by the grant, California, Texas, and Florida, are three of the four top states for this job demand. And furthermore, these are careers that can provide uh, a living wage, an excellent career opportunity for our students. So we were really excited about how we could leverage OER to expand opportunities in transportation planning. Go ahead. So what we looked at first, of course, is what so many people have talked about, just the, the sheer cost 
And uh, we've seen time and time again through studies like the student textbook and course materials survey done in Florida, that these create barriers to student success. Um, individuals who don't purchase the textbook, uh, up to an, an over 64%, uh, over 40% not registering for a specific course because uh, of some of those textbook costs, uh, also poor grades, or even dropping the course. So if we're not able to educate uh, those students from diverse backgrounds, uh, might be low income, first generation college students in these fields, then of course they're not gonna show up in the workforce because we've precluded them from participating in the educational opportunities. Go ahead. So this brings us to uh, Lambert's 2018 paper, really looking at the three types of justice uh, available through the production of open educational resources and open education pedagogy and andragogy. So uh, we heard this morning in uh, the keynotes uh, discussion from uh, Dr. Jasmine Roberts Cruz, uh, a lot of very applicable information uh, to, to what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, one thing that really stuck with me from that talk was thinking about open education is not an absolute disruptor. It has opportunities to aid in these social justice movements, but only with intentionality. And that's something we're still working to develop through our OER transport project. So one of the ways that we've done that is to think about it twofold. One, the use of the OER materials, and second, how these types of justice are also reflected in our field of transportation planning. And I want to encourage you to do the same. So when we talk first about redistributive justice, um, this is what comes to mind most readily with OER. Uh, these are, are really just that idea of that accessibility, making educational resources free, uh, for users and opening up courses and, and textbooks to learners who might otherwise not be in a position to afford them. And this is also overlaps uh, consistently with the same learners who have historically been excluded from these educational opportunities um, or have been prohibited from participating in those workforce opportunities as well. Go ahead. So in our case, as you've heard from many others, we have a field, uh, it's a STEM field, uh, science, tech, tech, uh, technology, um, and mathematics and engineering that is uh, one where textbook costs are traditionally high. Uh, here you see three examples, all of them over $125. Furthermore, we heard from some of our colleagues because of the multidisciplinary nature of transportation planning that in times in the past, they were using not just one textbook, but sometimes multiple textbooks. So in the case of the OER that our colleagues at Cal Poly are creating, they are combining what used to be not just three textbooks, but actually three different re prerequisite courses in mathematics, physics, um, and, and really taking those together um, and statistics, I believe is the third one, to um, create one single course with one single textbook that has all of the prerequisites needed for someone going into transportation planning. And this really is not only saving those students money, but also valuable time and resources in, in their course taking schedule. So here's an example of redistributive justice uh, through OER in our project. We also see this in transportation planning as a field. And so there's a, an opportunity to uh, take a, a sort of a meta approach and consider how we're also teaching our students these principles of justice. So one example would be uh, a city such as Kansas City, which has made uh, all of their transit free citywide. And it's the first city uh, in the United States, uh, first major city to do so. So I'm curious, and, and please go ahead and put in chat as we're going along, if something occurs to you, either from your experience at, in OER, uh, and, and hopefully you have this redistributive justice just through that act of, of making your textbooks uh, openly available, free and accessible, 
but also in your field of how these same principles come to bear. So moving on uh, to the next form of justice, we're going to talk about representational justice. So here, what we're really trying to understand is how we are representing members of our community and that that representation should be self-determined. So much like our keynote speaker said, the idea here is citing those closest to the issues, uh, citing the individuals who are uh, progressing this work. Uh, and that's often times um, trying to elevate what have historically been marginalized voices. So in our case, in our OER production, we have uh, decided to have some elements of co-construction of the OER text and editing opened up to our students. So we want to have them uh, participating in that process. Um, and this is a, an opportunity for student voices to be uh, heard, recognized, and also represented in the text. Uh, and hopefully for students to also see themselves represented in the text through the examples that are given. So I'd like to give a, a special shout out to my own students who I invited to attend today, uh, several of whom are in the audience, and uh, really encourage them throughout today, as well as all of us, to really take that um, our voices uh, seriously in our opportunity to represent in OER text. So one another example of this in our textbooks in the next slide is a text that's being done in green cities and transportation. Um, this is uh, from uh, Dr. Reyes, and she really highlights the contributions that are being made in transportation opportunities and transportation equity in the global South. So historically, when we talk about transportation, we think about the global North. We think about you know, what's happening in the United States, what's happening in Europe and really foregrounding and highlighting those examples here provides an opportunity uh, to recenter our thinking on uh, where is the, that uh, amazing work being done uh, as opposed to just always defaulting uh, to our historic text, our North American examples. So a great example here of representational justice of really uh, bringing those voices into the conversation and really um, centering those voices in our discussions of what our transportation future can be. So again, I'm curious if you have examples of representational justice, either in uh, an intentionality of how you've cited various sources in your OER or in your field. Again, you can we can put those in, in um, the chat and we'll talk about you know, those, those at the end. So the third form of uh, justice is recognitive. And here we want to have a recognition, a rethinking of how we respect and legitimize uh, various differences and really want to uh, have our learning context be one that is open and welcoming to all of those diverse perspectives. Um, and this, uh, we've talked about this a lot in terms of, uh, again, uh, the, the assignments, the way things are structured. So a lot of pedagogy or andragogy is involved here too. And there can be a, a lot of intentionality placed around this. So the example that I have on the next slide is one that hopefully you're all familiar with. It is just making alt text, alternative text available to images, which throughout this presentation for any student that might download it, it, it already has those present, um, but normally those are maybe in the background, but here I've foregrounded uh, that alternative text um, that a screen reader might read for a student who uh, has some sort of visual accessibility need. And the description here also, I think, further uh, gives us a way to see into uh, how we're thinking about uh, our users of transit 
And so again, there's, there's kind of this meta level of thinking about the transportation planning examples of the justice and how we're sure to discuss those throughout the text in our classrooms, our pedagogy, and also um, how this is represented through the opportunities that OER afford us to advance uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion through a focus on things like the recognitive justice. So in transportation planning, of course, we talk a lot about the Americans with Disabilities Act, ADA, and having accessible transportation, um, but it even goes beyond that. Uh, many of you may have heard of the curb cut effect. So the idea here being that when we create a, that, that ramp that makes uh, the curb accessible to someone who's utilizing a wheeled mobility device or uh, a, a walker or cane, it also helps those of us who might be pushing strollers or even just have a, a roller bag for our luggage. So these accessibility aspects and the focus on recognitive justice really improves the educational opportunities for all students. If we are able to support our most vulnerable students in their educational pursuits and ultimately in the field, then we are serving all of the students uh, at a greater capacity. So in conclusion, you can see next slide. Um, what I, I really hope today that you are, thank you, Heidi, for our, our uh, note of five minutes. Uh, perfect timing uh, that I really hope you're thinking about ways um, that your OER are, are getting on the bus of advancing these concepts of justice, uh, redistributive, representational, and recognitive in the work that you're doing. Um, it's not just free textbooks. There's a lot more uh, that we have to offer uh, through these open educational frameworks that don't exist in the same way in a traditional uh, publishing scenario. So with that, I would like to thank everyone again um, and open it up for questions. And comments, please tell me your examples. Thank you, Amber. Yes, you welcome to post your questions or comments in the chat if you also want to unmute yourself and contribute that way. Um, we have just under five minutes uh, for questions or conversations. But thank you, Amber, for tying. I really appreciate you tying the um, that not only to the text itself, but to the field and, and incorporating those examples. So that was really interesting. And I want to point out that Sabrina did post a link to um, Sarah Lambert's uh, article in the chat earlier. So if you missed that, um, it is posted earlier on. Thank you to my UTA colleagues and others responding uh, in the in the chat and um, really hope to continue to advance this work. Yes. Do we have any other questions or comments for Amber?
If not, I will, uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.